ketchup, kimchi, french fries, noodles and sushi. Our new restaurants will have some new additions in the new menu. Do you want to learn how to play food chain magnet, the ketchup mechanism and other ideas expansion? In this video, we're going to take you through all of the new modules that come with this Food Chain Magnate expansion, assuming that you're familiar with the base game. If you aren't, you can check out the link to our How to Play for the Base Game in the description below. Otherwise, let's move on and learn about the Ketchup Mechanism, coming up. It's Tarrant and Stella from Eagle University. Now let's get to the new modules for Food Chain Magnate, a game by Jeroen Duman and Joris Wiersinger and published by Splotter. The Ketchup Mechanism is a modular expansion for Food Chain Magnate, introducing a total of 17 new and interchangeable modules to the game. You can mix and match these modules in any combination you wish in order to add some flexibility into your setup for Food Chain Magnate. Across the course of this video, we will take you through each and every one of the new modules added to the game. Firstly, you'll be pleased to note that the game can now be played with six players. There are pieces for the Siap Saji restaurant, which many of you will recognize from Slotter's earlier game, Indonesia. There is a new six player turn order track, and new copies of several base game milestones so that you now have six of each. The game comes with six new map tiles and for the six player game you'll need at least four of them to make the map large enough. Remove the tiles showing the two parks unless you're playing with the lobbyist module, then shuffle the rest in with your other tiles and lay them out in a six by four rectangle. I'll take you through the features of the new map tiles a little bit later in the video. As for the five player game, you'll use three copies of each of the one times employees. The expansion also comes with large versions of each of the food and drink tokens, with a large one representing five small ones. So with that, let's get into some of the expansion modules. The four modules I'm going to talk about in this section introduce new foods to the game, which break some of the marketing rules that you're familiar with from the base game. Each of these adds some new kitchen staff employees to the game. These are the kimchi module, the sushi module, the noodle module, and the french fries module. These four modules can be used independently or in combination with each other. And at the end of this section, we'll talk about how they interact. To set up any of these four modules, place the corresponding employees on the table, remembering that the kimchi master, sushi chef, and noodle chef are all one-times employees. Additionally, replace the kitchen trainees, burger cooks, and pizza cooks from the base game with those from the expansion, as those reflect the new career paths. The first module is kimchi, and this introduces the kimchi master. The kimchi master is unlike any of the employees in the base game. Because of this triangle, it can be hired directly without having to be trained from another employee. But she automatically requires a salary and is a one-times employee. The kimchi master produces a single kimchi each round. This occurs at the end of the cleanup phase rather than during the working nine to five phase. However, it occurs after you've had to throw out leftover ingredients. And so even if you don't have a freezer, you can automatically store the kimchi produced until the next round. If you wish to keep kimchi beyond the next cleanup phase, then you will need to have the freezer milestone as usual. And kimchi has a very strong odor, so no other foods or drinks may be stored in your freezer other than kimchi. Kimchi is the most sought after food by houses in the game, and in fact it's automatically sought after and does not need to be marketed. A house will always go to a location where it can buy its full demand plus kimchi before it goes to a location where it can buy its full demand without kimchi. So here, even though green is at a price of seven and a distance of zero, house one will travel all the way to blue with a price of 10 and a distance of five to fulfill the full demand plus kimchi. Kimchi has the same base price as everything else. So here, coming from a house with a garden, this player would be selling five goods for $100. However, the house will not visit the restaurant with kimchi if it cannot fulfill the rest of the demand. 
Here, for example, the house requires two burgers and the restaurant can sell only one, and the restaurant must be accessible by road as usual. If multiple restaurants can serve the full demand plus kimchi, then the normal rules apply and price plus distance would determine who gets the sale. The next module is sushi, which introduces the sushi cook and the sushi chef. These work like the burger and pizza cooks and chefs, such that you can train a kitchen trainee to a sushi cook, and a sushi cook to a sushi chef, which is a one times cart. The sushi cook will produce two sushi, and the sushi chef will produce five sushi. Kitchen trainees can still produce only burgers and pizza, they are not skilled enough to produce sushi. Much like kimchi, sushi is never marketed directly to the houses on the board. Instead, houses which have gardens will automatically seek sushi if its entire demand can be met with sushi. Consider again here the blue restaurant which has two sushi. House number one has demand for a single lemonade, but because it has a garden it will prefer to go to a restaurant which has at least one sushi rather than one which has a lemonade. So here, house one will visit blue, removing the demand and one sushi, and selling it for the standard price. The house's entire demand must be replaced by sushi in order to sell its sushi. So in the case here of house seven, blue could not sell two sushi plus one burger, it would have to be three sushi to jump ahead of green, who has the proper demand. In this case, green would be the one to sell to house seven. And remember that sushi is an upmarket dish which is only sold to houses with gardens. So house 10 without a garden will still prefer to go to the green restaurant to get the proper demand. The next module is noodles and it works in a fairly similar way to the sushi model but favours volume over quality. Once again it introduces the noodle cook and the noodle chef and you can train the noodle cook from the kitchen trainee. A noodle cook produces six noodles and a noodle chef produces 16 noodles. Once again, like the sushi and kimchi, noodles are never marketed directly to the houses. Rather, you can think of them as a backup plan for any house that can't get its preferred demand anywhere else. When evaluating each house, first determine whether there is a restaurant which can meet its demand properly. If there is not, then check to see if there's a restaurant which can meet the entire demand with noodles. Once again, the restaurant cannot mix and match, the entire demand must be met with noodles. If such a restaurant exists and it's accessible to the house, then the sale will be made with noodles instead of the advertised product. As you can see on this board, all of the houses have demand for coke and this restaurant can't supply any of it. But Blue has enough noodles to supply all of the houses, making this an incredibly profitable round of noodles. Each of these food modules breaks the base rules in a different way, and so if you're using them all in the same game, you'll need to know how they interact with each other. For this specific house here, with two burgers and a lemonade marketed, this order from top to bottom represents the priority order in which that house will visit these restaurants. It will first look for a house that can fulfill the whole demand in sushi plus kimchi. Then it will look for the actual demand plus kimchi, and then noodles plus kimchi. Then it will look for sushi, the actual demand, and finally noodles. For a house without a garden, the restaurants with sushi are not considered by that house. It's only once multiple restaurants can meet the same type of demand that you look at price and distance to determine where that house visits. The final food module is French fries, which introduces the fry chef. Any one of the game's four cooks can be trained into a fry chef. There are no tokens to represent the french fries that the fry chef produces. Instead, it's assumed that you automatically sell one serve of french fries to each house that eats at one of your restaurants during dinner time. This will be worth a $10 bonus for each house served. This is a bonus, not a sale of goods, and so this is a fixed price. It is unaffected by gardens, discount or pricing managers, and so on. If you employ multiple fry chefs, then you can serve multiple french fries to each house, giving you an additional $10 bonus per house per fry chef. The next module is the coffee module, which adds the most new mechanisms to the game of any of these modules. This adds three new employees, the trainee barista, the barista and lead barista, 
as well as the first coffee sold milestone and the coffee tokens. Each player also gets three coffee shop tokens at the start of the game, matching their restaurant. The coffee module is based on the premise that a house, when driving to a restaurant, will stop off at coffee shops along the way to buy coffee, and this allows you to sell coffee while another player is making a restaurant sale. A barista trainee is a basic employee which can be hired and commands no salary. In the working 9 to 5 phase he will produce one coffee. The barista trainee can be trained into a barista who, during the working phase, produces two coffee. She requires a salary. She can then be trained into a lead barista who is a one times card and produces five coffee. Like other food and drinks, coffee must be thrown away at the end of the round and, unlike other food and drinks, cannot be stored in your freezer, for obvious reasons. You can get your coffee shops onto the board in one of two ways. Either by training your baristas or by getting the first coffee sold milestone. It's so represented by this icon down the bottom of the card when you train to a barista. As a bonus, you get to place one coffee shop at a road distance of up to two. And when you train a barista to a lead barista, you place one coffee shop anywhere on the board. This milestone also lets you place a one-off coffee shop anywhere on the board. Per the normal placement rules, coffee shops must go onto empty spaces and adjoining roads. A coffee shop is considered to have a door on all four sides. Once a coffee shop has been placed, it can count as a starting point for any other distance limited action in the game. And so even if you don't intend to sell coffee, it can be a good way to move and spread around the board without placing restaurants. If ever you're allowed to place a coffee shop and you've used all three, then you may move one of your coffee shops instead. Finally, there may never be more than one coffee shop of any player on a single tile. So now, let's look at how to determine who sells coffee. Firstly, for a house to buy coffee, that house must be going out to eat at a restaurant. Here, no restaurant can serve House 18's demand, and so House 18 will not buy coffee. For a house that is going out to eat, Determine where that house is eating via the normal method, ignoring coffee entirely. Here, House 7 will visit Green because Green can sell sushi. And sushi outranks pizza, per the rules described before. Next, determine the route that that house takes to get to that restaurant, and it will be the shortest route as measured by distance. In this case, the house will go along this route into the restaurant like so. Find every coffee shop and restaurant along that route from a player who has coffee. Each such restaurant and coffee shop will sell one coffee to that house. The final destination does not sell coffee. The price for each coffee sold is determined in the same way as any other food or beverage in the game. A base price of $10 which can be modified by pricing managers, gardens and so on. Any coffees sold are then discarded. Now let's look at some of the other specific considerations to determine what route a house takes. Whenever there is any doubt on the route, the house will take the shortest route by distance that goes past the most servers of coffee. So let's look at some examples. Imagine the blue coffee shop were here instead of here. House 7 could get to this restaurant out this door and straight in or it could go out the back door, past this coffee shop, and then around and into the restaurant like so. Remember that distance in Food Chain Magnate is counted by the number of tile borders crossed, and so both of those are distance too. As such, House 7 will go out the back door, buying coffee here, and then go around the house to the restaurant like so. Now, let's look at House 5 which will be dining at Santa Maria because it's the only one that can serve two coke. There are several different routes that could be taken of distance two, but the one which passes the most restaurants and coffee shops without doubling back is to come out here, run around past there, and then up here, buying from both of those, before finishing here. A restaurant with no coffee available doesn't count when considering the route, and so in this case here, the route which serves the most coffee and has it available is D5. 
down past here, buying from both here and here. The route we showed before around this way yields only one coffee in that scenario. Finally, when an entire route or a portion of a route is tied for both distance and number of coffee shops, the house becomes indecisive and buys no coffee on the disputed portion of the route. Consider this scenario here. House 5 can come around past here, past these two restaurants, and complete there for a total of three coffees, or can come out around this side, again buying from here, buying from these two before coming here. Both of these routes go past here. This is an indisputed part of the route where coffee can be bought. But from that point forward to the restaurant, the rest of the route is tied at a distance of two and two coffees, and therefore none of those will sell coffee. As such, you can see a lot of consideration goes into where the most profitable locations to place your coffee shops, or to place coffee shops to disrupt opponents, should go. Next, we'll look at all the modules which allow some new features on the map. The expansion comes with these six new map tiles. The top three don't add any new rules, you can simply shuffle them in with the base game. Lemonade Junction gives you an effective way of getting lemonade. This tile gives you two late round locations in the same place, which could be efficient if you market to it effectively. And this tile places House 25 on the board, which can be the only house on the board at the start of the game with a garden. Houses Pi and 9 and 3 quarters are both apartment buildings. These are high density living and they work slightly differently to the normal houses. Firstly, whenever products are marketed to an apartment building, two demand tokens are placed instead of one. Secondly, there is no limit to the maximum number of demand tokens which may be placed on an apartment building. However, you must still be able to meet the entire demand of an apartment building that is accessible in order to sell to it. And so, if you plan for it well, you may be able to make a huge windfall with a single sale. You could never build a garden on an apartment building, and so you cannot double its price in this way. The last new tile is this one, which shows two parks, and this is used only with the lobbyist module, which we'll go through now. Lobbyists give you unprecedented flexibility over the map, allowing you to place new parks and even build new roads. The lobbyist is an employee card which can be hired directly, but immediately requires a salary to be paid. When you play a lobbyist into your structure, you may either place one new road tile, or build one new park. This is done between steps 5 and 6 of working 9 to 5, so after new houses and gardens, but before new restaurants. To place a park, choose any one of the four park tokens, and then place it somewhere on the board at a road distance of up to two. Parks may never be moved once they've been placed, and so once all four of the parks are gone, this action may no longer be taken. Parks have some similarities with gardens, but they are not exactly the same. Much like a garden, a house that is adjacent to a park will pay double the base price for food. However, unlike a garden, this does not increase the house's maximum demand from 3 to 5, and it does not make the house interested in buying sushi. If a house is adjacent to two parks, it still pays only double the base price for food, and if a house has both a garden and is adjacent to a park, then it will pay triple the base price for food. As mentioned before, apartment buildings may never have gardens, but they may be placed adjacent to parks, and this will double the base price paid by that apartment block. The lobbyist's other option is to build a new road. And once again, part of this road must be at a road distance of two from your restaurant. To take this action, take any one of the eight road tiles, flip it over to the under construction side, and then adjoin it to the map. Each of these arrows must point either to an existing piece of road, or directly to your restaurant entrance, meaning that this would also be a legal placement. Then additionally, place an under construction token onto the square of road that is attached to your new construction. These will be there only for a single turn. In the dinner time phase immediately following the placement of this road, 
the under construction road may not be used and the road that is underneath these tokens may be used but counts as an additional distance of one when counting distances. As such, even if you're not interested in the new road, you can use the lobbyist to hold up opponents temporarily. During the cleanup phase, you'll then remove any under construction tokens that are on the board and flip new roads over to their usable side. Roads may never be moved once they've been placed on the board and once again, once there are no more road tiles left, this action may no longer be taken. Finally, when using the lobbyist module, you'll include this new milestone, first lobbyist used. The player who gains this immediately adds one new tile from all of the tiles that weren't used to build the city at the start of the game and joins it onto the edge of the city. This can be placed anywhere, provided it doesn't interfere with something that's already on the edge of the board and is placed immediately during the working 9 to 5 phase, meaning that the subsequent actions may be taken on that tile. The last of the map modules is the Rural Marketing module. For this, you require the Rural Marketeer, the first Rural Marketeer used milestone, and then the Rural Market, Rural Billboards, and the Freeway off -ramps. At the start of the game, set up the Rural Market off to the side of the main board. This is an outlying town somewhere near the city who might occasionally come into the big city to get some food. To bring the rural market into the game, you must first hire a rural marketeer, which is trained from a marketing trainee. Then when you play the rural marketeer, you may immediately place one giant billboard adjacent to the rural market. The giant billboard is always a form of eternal marketing regardless of any milestones you may have and so whatever you choose to market on it will be marketed to the rural market for the rest of the game. As with the eternal marketing milestone, this marketeer is now permanently active on this billboard. There are only four giant billboards in the game and so there's room for a total of four things to be marketed to the rural market. The first player or players to use a rural marketeer gain this milestone, letting them place a freeway off ramp and essentially determine where the rural market is. These players then place a freeway off ramp token adjacent to a road which leaves the city. Once the milestones have been taken and that round is over, no more off ramps will be placed and the location of this market will be set for the rest of the game. From that point forward, the rural market behaves in a very similar way to the apartment buildings. On each round, marketing is doubled, that is, two tokens for every one token on a billboard, and there is no maximum demand. A player must be able to meet the entire demand to sell to the rural market, and the restaurant must be accessible from a freeway off-ramp. If multiple players can meet the demand, then determine the tie by price and distance to a freeway off-ramp. This infinity here represents the order number for the rural market. The rural market is always the last one to be resolved during dinner time. The next two modules introduce two new employees, the night shift manager and the mass marketeer. And I'm calling these expediters because they have a significant effect on the number of actions available in the game. The Night Shift Manager module introduces this employee. Like the Kimchi Master, he can be hired directly, but is a one-times card and immediately requires a salary. Like all management employees, the Night Shift Manager may only report up to the CEO. In this case, the special Stella CEO card that I got her for her birthday a couple years ago. The Night Shift Manager has no slots and has no direct reports. However, when you have an active night shift manager, all of your non-salaried employees work twice in this round instead of once. So in this structure here, you'd be able to train two people. This would count as two waitresses, both for ties and for gaining money. You could do two marketing campaigns, drop your prices twice, and have the kitchen trainee produce two food. But the truck driver is salaried, and so he would only work once. The bonus applies only to non-management employees, and the one marketing trainee may conduct two campaigns at once. In this case, the card would have two busy tokens placed on it. But an important restriction is that the trainer must still train different people, unless you already have a milestone or bonus letting you train the same person twice in a day. 
The Mass Marketeering module introduces the Mass Marketer, who can be trained from a marketing trainee. Mass Marketeers can be used to flood the markets, not only with your own ads, but with all players' ads. For each Mass Marketeer that has been played by any player during a round, there will be an additional marketing phase. Consider this layout here supposing two Mass Marketeers have been played by different players during the round. First, resolve the normal marketing phase. Here, marketing burgers to these three houses, then a pizza here, and then lemonade here. Then, conduct this Mass Marketeers marketing phase. In this case, marketing burgers here and here, but not here because it's already full, and then a pizza here. Again, these two are full, so they won't take another lemonade. Then, conduct this Mass Marketeers marketing phase, this time putting a burger here and a pizza here. Only then do you remove one token from each of the advertising campaigns and remove any that are complete. In this way, you can use Mass Marketeers to completely flood the market with demand that other players may not have been expecting. There are two more new employee modules in this expansion, the Gourmet Food Critic and the Movie Stars. The Gourmet Food Critic is a marketeer who can be trained from a marketing trainee. The Gourmet Food Critic, when played, may launch a campaign using a snooty guidebook. This will market the chosen sorts of goods at a maximum duration of three to all houses on the board with gardens. The marketing campaign is not placed on the board itself and there's no busy token for it, so you can just keep it with your food critic to indicate that he's busy. Parks do not count as gardens for the purposes of the food critic. The other new employee is the movie stars. When using the movie stars, use the waitresses from the expansion as this shows that they can be trained into movie stars. With the movie stars, there are nine of them, three Bs, three Cs and three Ds, but they are a one times card. So when you're setting up, if you're playing with five or six players, you'll use only three movie stars, a B, a C and a D. With four players, you'll remove the D, and with two or three players, you'll remove the C. All of these other movie stars that you'll never use are simply because the game's produced with three identical decks of cards in your box. During the game, you may train one of your waitresses into a movie star. The first player to do this would take the B movie star, the next would take the C, and the next would take the D. Movie stars are a one-times card and require a salary, and they no longer gain you cash. However, they give you a couple of new bonuses. Firstly, when it comes to phase two of each round, which is choosing position in turn order, movie stars are now the first determining factor in who gets first choice. So in this scenario, having the B movie star outranks having 12 empty slots and Stella's company would get to choose turn order position first. If multiple players have movie stars, then the B movie star outranks the C movie star, who outranks the D movie star. Only after all of the movie stars are resolved do you then look at who has the most slots in the corporate structure. Secondly, when it comes to breaking ties after two companies are tied for price and distance, whereas normally the company with the most waitresses would break the tie, now the company with the highest rated movie star breaks the tie. Only after all movie stars have been resolved in sequence do you then look at waitresses and finally turn order to determine who makes the sale. The final four modules in the game make some changes to some more of the base concepts in the game, the reserves and the milestones. First, there is the reserve prices module, and in this module each player gets these three reserve cards instead of these three to choose from at the start of the game. As usual, this dictates how the game will change when the bank breaks for the first time. Recall that in the base game, the reserve cards tell you how much money goes in the bank and how many slots each player's CEO will have for the second half of the game. Now, all players will still add $200 into the bank, however, the base price may change depending on which reserve cards are played. When the bank breaks, open up all the reserve cards and then see which one has the majority. In this case, it's this two, 20. For the rest of the game, each item of food or drink sold will have a base price of $20 instead of 10. 
This can combo significantly with your garden houses and tell you whether you really want to focus on gardens or if you want to focus on volume. If there is a tie for number of a certain reserve card in the pot, then $20 takes precedence over $5, which takes precedence over 10. This means you're more likely than not to change the base price halfway through the game. The Hard Choices module adds a time limit onto five of the game's milestones. Now, if you want one of those milestones, you have to commit to it early. First Burger, Pizza and Drink Marketed, and First to Train Someone will all disappear after turn two, and First to Hire Three People in One Turn will disappear after turn three. The New Milestones module introduces a completely new set of 17 milestones which can be used instead of the 18 that came with the base game. These are not intended to be mixed and matched. You will note that the expansion comes with some new plane tokens showing an A and B and these are related to this milestone and replace the token of the same number. The new milestones also come with hard choices with first marketeer, first recruiting girl and first trainer, all slated to disappear after turn two. I'm not going to take you through the specifics of each of these milestones, I'll leave you to read them in the rulebook. Finally, we have the game's namesake, the ketchup mechanism, one new milestone that you can add to the base set or the expansion set. The ketchup milestone is awarded to a player who has marketed goods that are then sold by someone else. Here, Blue has marketed this pizza, and then green is going to make the first sale. The blue player will then get the ketchup mechanism for the rest of the game. From this point forward, during dinner time, deduct one from the distance between your restaurant and the house you're selling to. This will make your restaurant a little bit more competitive without costing you on base price. Ketchup even works on houses which only want drinks because everything tastes better with ketchup. And that's how to play the new modules for Food Chain Magnate. We hope you enjoyed this video and we hope you enjoy playing. If you enjoy this video, please help us by hitting the like button. Subscribe to us, you can also hit the meeple in the corner to do so and hit the bell icon so you'll be one of the first to know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journeys. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please write them in the comment section below. Until next time!